Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today in our continuing education series. Today, our featured topic is emergency restoration. My name is Jessica Petrohoy, and I'm the marketing coordinator at FiberOptic.com. FiberOptic.com is a leading provider of fiber optic products, training, and rental equipment. Fiber optics networks have realized tremendous growth with more data being sent today than ever before. We have moved beyond 10G networks to 100G networks, and the demand for more communications grows as more and more data is being consumed. When these networks are properly configured and data is flowing, the world is a great place. But when these networks stop, it seems as if the whole world has stopped along with them. We know that problems are going to occur, and the goal is to get systems back online as quickly as possible. Having a plan and being prepared can reduce the outage time and get the network back online quickly. But this time, I'd like to introduce Terry Power. Terry is one of our senior instructors and an outside plant technician with over 25 years in managing networks. Terry will be discussing the value of an emergency restoration plan and the savings that a company can realize by implementing such a solution. When Terry is finished, we will be taking questions from the GoToMeeting chat box. Thank you again for joining us today, and at this time, I will turn the presentation over to Terry. And good afternoon, everyone. Again, this is Terry Power. I'm senior instructor here at the Fiber School and uh, have been doing communications electronics in the outside plant since 1987. So I guess they're pretty accurate with the 25 years. Um, I will try to not digress too much into stories from the field, uh, but there will be a couple of things that come up as we go through the conversation. Now we're going to be talking about emergency restoration. And one of the things that I wanted to do before we even get started is to define what it is that we're talking about. What do we mean by emergency restoration? You kind of hear subjects like emergency restoration, plant restoration, and disaster recovery all get uh, muddied together to a certain degree. And you hear them used, unfortunately, interchangeably at times. And so what we're going to do to start off is define the scope of what we're talking about. And we're going to start talking about emergency restoration. That is the topic of, some, of this afternoon's uh, webinar and this presentation. I'm going to give you here a few ideas of what we're talking about, and then we're going to hit the next two topics about what we're not going to be talking about today. Emergency restoration is just what it sounds like. It is making the customer's services work. Let that sink in for a second. That's all we're trying to do at the point of emergency restoration. We are turning the customers back on. And we're doing that in as quick in an efficient manner as possible. Now, people talk about plant restoration. Now, plant restoration is what happens after the emergency restoration. That is when we worry about getting the, the plant itself back up to proper specs. During the emergency restoration process, as we talk about it today, you will see that the idea here is not necessarily to worry as much about pretty. Uh, the, pro uh, the issue is going to be turning the customers back on. Plant restoration is when we come back after the fact, scheduled outage time when we can relax, take our time, and do it right and pretty and clean and we restore the plant to the proper specifications. Now the last word or last phrase that kind of gets uh, grouped together here and a lot of times gets mistaken for emergency restoration is disaster recovery. Disaster recovery is another term that sounds like exactly what it is. Uh, I spent uh, 2004 working in Florida on all three storms that hit the 
uh, Peninsula and then ended up in the Cayman Islands working on disaster recovery uh, from Hurricane Ivan. I promise you emergency restoration is not what we were doing. We were actually recovering from devastation. And when I think of disaster recovery, I'm thinking of those experiences where we were starting over in a lot of cases. Uh, so I just wanted to take a couple of minutes here to uh, remind you that when we talk about emergency restoration, we're talking about a fairly narrow uh, definition, and everything we talk about from here on out is going to be geared toward that narrow definition of turning the customers back on, restoring service, and making sure that all service level agreements are met. That's the focus of today's presentation. So with that said, I'm going to start off with one phrase that we uh, teach to students here at the fiber school. In every class, we teach about the uh, fiber optic network. And that is the key to an effective, efficient restoration is planning and preparation. And those are the things that we're going to talk about uh, in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. All right, with restoration planning, one of the first things we've got to do is identify the cause of the failure. It may not be the outside plant. It may not even be the glass itself. We've got to make sure in the process that we have identified that it is not uh, the transmitter, the receiver, the connectors, or any of the uh, immediate patch panel or patch cords that are connecting those to the outside plant. Once we have identified that cause, then it's time to start worrying about, we found out it's outside. We know the light is leaving the building and it's now time to look at why it's not getting to the other end. So locating where the failure is. Here we pull out our OTDR because while a power meter and light source is always going to be most accurate for determining loss, and a power meter at the receive end would tell us that the light was getting there, that's part of the troubleshooting process in the identify a category we just talked about. But an OTDR does one thing, and it does one thing very well, and that is show distance to the event or distance to the crisis. Whatever our problem is, the only tool that shows us distance is going to be the OTDR. And we've got to remember here, um, and we'll talk about documentation in a, in a little bit more detail in later slides, but we've got to remember that the OTDR is going to give us the optical distance of the core of the fiber. And there are a lot of ways that that can be uh, different from geography. Now that's going to be the longest possible measurement, which will take into account any helix factor, any twist in the fiber. Uh, all of our slack points, all of that is going to be shown as part of the distance on the OTDR while it may not be distance on the ground. So uh, we've got to make sure that we have all the proper documentation in place. Again, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then with the restoration itself, we've identified the cause, we've identified the location of our fault, now we've got to respond with the proper tools and the proper supplies and the proper equipment. And that's where we're going to use the emergency restoration kit. And we'll talk about that uh, about halfway through the presentation. We're going to dig in hard to talking about the kit itself. All right, restoration tools. There are just several tools that we have to have available to us, and you'll notice that even on here, documentation is one of those tools because without it, we can't do our job. An inspection scope or probe. 
this is going to allow us to look at connectors. This is going to be part of that troubleshooting process. It is very possible, and in fact, highly likely, uh, that the problem, barring a tractor trailer taking out a pole or some guy with a backhoe, uh, it's very possible or very likely, in fact, that the problem is going to be connectors. 90 or so percent of link failures in existing fiber optic links occurs because of contamination at the connectors. Now, I said I was going to avoid too many in the field stories, but this one really applies here. And it applies to the inspection microscope and to the cleaning kit. And I'm going to go ahead and talk about both of these together from, uh, for the rest of this little section. Uh, myself and another uh, uh, technician from here went to Haiti after the earthquake there. And we were called down to do test and repair on their fibers. They started getting intermittent links uh, between their cell sites, and they were flickering on and off, and then more and more off and flickering back on. So they brought us down there for a week to do test and repair, and we started doing testing. And we immediately noticed that we were failing for a bunch of really high reflection. We started cleaning the connectors, and then testing. Everything started passing for reflectance. Then we plug their plant back in. They turn everything back up after we had tested it, cleared, said, OK, go ahead and put light back on it. And they started calling us to ask us what we had done. And what do you mean, what have we done? We didn't do anything but clean. And all of a sudden, now their links are coming back up and stabilizing. Now, this is an area hit by an earthquake. And we expected all kinds of problems in the outside plant. Truth is, with one exception, all of the work I did for two weeks was testing and fixing stuff inside their buildings that had been done uh, less well than it could have been in the, in the initial uh, installation process. There was only one problem in the field, and it really wasn't associated with the earthquake. So this gives you an idea of how vital having proper cleaning and, and, and inspection scopes are. Now, when I'm talking about inspection scopes, I'm going to back up for a minute. The, the inspection scope, um, I really like probes. The probes that will plug into an OTDR, or sometimes you can get the standalone probes. It gives you a physical distance. You're not putting your eyeball right up against the glass. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, it also allows you to save an image, so if you're a contractor out there, and you're doing work, and uh, someone uh, you're reporting a bad connector, you can take a picture, save that image, and send it to someone and say, look, here's the problem. I'm not just telling you this to get out of doing work or whatever. Uh, the other possibility is that you've done your work, everything looks beautiful, and now's the time to move on. You want to make sure to take pictures of the good connectors so that you can say, hey, everything looked great. Here's the pictures when I left. Anything that happens after that, you've got something to cover yourself. Uh, but in the emergency restoration avenue, it's going to be about taking an image, verifying that the connector is, in fact, not part of the problem or the problem with the link failure. Uh, the cleaning kit, a uh, simple, simple cleaning kit would include some kind of lint-free wipes cleaning solution. I prefer alcohol, uh, but in my experience, I've found that uh, airlines don't like alcohol uh, being carried down to uh, foreign countries as much as I like using alcohol. So we have, do have some um, non-flammable uh, cleaning solutions that are available. Uh, there's a, a cleaning product called a Quick Click or One Click. You'll see different types of names. Uh, but it's a, a wand that has a tape 
element to it. Uh, I kind of refer to it as uh, fuzzy dental floss. It would be like if you made a pipe cleaner out of dental floss instead of wire. And it's very thin and it runs alongside a barrel. And when you click this inside the connector, it sweeps in a circle and sweeps out. So unlike uh, Q-tips or the sponge ramrod that just cram stuff back down into a connector, uh, the uh, quick clicks actually sweep stuff out and it makes a great dry cleaning. Now if you still don't get that connector clean and you check it with the probe, at some point you may have to get behind the connector. Now if you're not out doing testing and you're not allowed to do it, if it's your own plant, you should be able to get behind that connector, behind the bulkhead, pull off the connector, do your cleaning uh, with a wet dry cleaning with a solution and your lint free wipes, uh, verify that everything's clean with the probe, and then you should know that you're uh, getting out of the plant or getting out of the building and into the plant. So let's presume that now we've got everything cleaned, all the connectors are good, the transmitter is in fact working, which is another reason you want to use the probe instead of the uh, handheld direct view microscope because, I don't know, magnifying a laser beam 400 power and then shining it in my eyeball uh, doesn't seem like a good plan to me. You know, I've got you know 50 odd years on me and I don't have spots in my vision. I plan to keep it that way. Um, so now we've got the transmitters working. Uh, we've inspected the connectors, we've cleaned the connectors, we've verified that all of that is working, but we're not getting outside the building. So let's use a visual fault locator. Now with an OTDR, and we'll talk about this in actually another webinar session coming up in the next few months. Uh, with an OTDR, we're going to have what's called a dead zone. The pulse of light is going to blind the OTDR for a certain distance. Depending on how much power we need to reach the other side, that pulse width could be quite large. And it is possible that we don't see any detail within the building. So we're going to use a visual fault locator. And that will allow us to see breaks or faults within the building on the fiber itself by the light leaking out, uh, we will see where there's a fault because if there's no fault, the light keeps going and you don't see it leaking out the sides of the cable. Now a visual fault locator is, as I've already mentioned, a visible red laser operating somewhere in the 650 nanometers range. It is into the visible red range, uh, slightly above um, infrared in frequency or lower in wavelength. And depending on how far down into the visual range, you might get some that are more like uh, 635, which would have a little brighter, a little more visible. Uh, or you can go up to a higher wavelength like 670 that's closer to infrared. It's going to go further but in bright sunlight or brightly lit rooms or buildings, you may have more difficulty seeing the escaping light. So there's always a balancing act. I tend to, to err on the side of visibility and go with 635 or 650 range on the OTD, I mean on the uh, BFF. Now let's presume that we've identified the transmitters working, the connectors are clean, We've got clean light uh, inside the building. Uh, we can see that it's leaving the building. Now we're going to go to the OTDR. And again, the OTDR is going to give us distance. That's the first tool that really tells us where. Everything else is just giving us what are we, you know, it, it leaks out and we see it, or it gets to the other end, we measure it with a power meter, we see it. The only thing that gives us distance to event measurement is the OTDR. And again, the OTDR is going to show us every twist, wrap, slack, coil, everything 
in the glass because we're actually measuring the length of the core of the fiber itself. So here we get to documentation. Now, if I was called out and I go test a fiber and I say, okay, well, I'm measuring it, it goes 15 kilometers. Is that good or bad? I don't know. I have no way of knowing unless someone shows me the documentation that tells me where it's supposed to be going. I was out on a testing job fairly recently and I was shooting 22 kilometers and nobody could tell me where I was going. That didn't even match up with other buildings. So without good documentation, all you know is that it shot 15K or however far you shoot. You've got to have all of your documentation. You've got to know where all of your slack is. You've got to have some idea of the helix factor with outside plant cables depending on your fiber count. Uh, you could have 3% uh, helix factor of the twist in the buffer tubes or you could have as much as five or six on some larger counts. And be aware on really large counts where you have multiple racks of buffer tubes, uh, it is possible to have a shorter distance on fiber one and a longer distance on fiber 288, say, uh, because you've got a greater helix factor on the second rack, and it will actually have a a different optical length, it will be further uh, than the smaller inner route. Anyway, so documentation tells us not just where our slack is, but it also tells us where the fiber is running. We need to have good route plans, good identification of geographically where is the fiber. And if we know our slack and we know our uh, helix factor, or some estimate of it anyway, we can get within about 50 to 100 feet of the actual break, and usually that's pretty good. Uh, we can get down to, uh, I have shot within a small area, I've been able to get down to like within 10 feet of the actual fault. Uh, depending on how far, how big your distances are, or how short your runs are, and the accuracy of your helix factor, the accuracy of your documentation, you can get down to an address and whose yard or which, you know, which stretch of highway the, the fault is located. And all of this comes back to knowing what's in the field and where it is. All right, moving on, let's see. Restoration documentation. Now, here's a few things that uh, uh, that need to be there, and I'm going to. Uh, we've kind of covered the route plan and as-built records to a to a, a pretty full extent. The restoration plan. Now, the restoration plan is the actual who's doing what to whom, and that's going to be written for your particular system. Who's on call? Who responds? Uh, is there an on-call phone number that gets forwarded? Is there a separate cell phone that's carried by the on-call tech? Who's their backup? Uh, where, you know, who's doing what to whom? There should be some order at which this is going to occur. You know, we call the on-call tech. The on-call tech puts uh, backup people on standby. They go and double and, and do their troubleshooting, find out where the problem is. Uh, if they put people on standby ahead of time, then it should be a quick response to get to the field with all of the proper stuff and begin work. Then we're going to have probably built into that some escalating call tree where the supervisor gets woke up next and then the manager after so long and then the manager's manager after that until, I don't know, I mean, sometimes I feel like we're calling a congressman to tell him there's a fiber outage. And of course, every one of those people is now calling the on-call tech to ask him when it's going to, him or her, excuse me, when it's going to be back on. And that adds to the stress. 
that adds to the overall um, tension level that is going on that we will talk about when we get to the um, actual uh, discussion of the kit. All right, now the as-built records and route plan. This goes back to what we were talking about. I'm not going to stay here too long and belabor uh, the point. But if we don't know where it is and, and what's running out there and along what route, the fanciest OTDR in the world is only going to tell me how far it goes. And that could be a straight line toward the moon for all I know if I don't have good route plans and good as the record. All right, manufacturer cable data sheet. Now these come on the reels when we receive a large reel of outside plant cable. It's going to have the manufacturer, it's going to have a part number, it's going to have the count, it's going to have the beginning and end tick marks, all of that kind of information. When the fiber is installed in the plant, we should be saving these records or these data sheets uh, to make them part of the permanent record. Um, some kind of good asset management software package uh, will also assist with tracking this and uh, backing up for just a minute. A good asset management software package will help with uh, the route planning and as-built records. And in fact, some of them will actually go so far as to associate an OTDR trace to a span of fiber. And uh, you can look at a good trace that's associated. You can follow along and kind of do an X marks the spot on a map if you've got a, a good piece of software and there's some pretty decent ones available at reasonable prices. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more about that, you can get in touch with us uh, after the webinar. That's outside the scope of this, but I did want to mention it uh, because it would be a huge asset when you're uh, when you're working on the fiber. All right, so those data sheets may or may not be useful, but it's one of those things that I would rather have and never need than to need it and not have it. So uh, collect those data sheets, but also uh, gives you the ability to look at what kind of fibers, part numbers, uh, will help with warranties if there are fiber failures uh, in the field without, of course, trauma from a tractor trailer or a backhoe. Attenuation records, knowing how much loss I had between A and B before I started, before the crisis, will help me know what it is I'm trying to restore back to. If I don't know how much loss I had and I plug it all in, it may be enough to make it work, but is it as good as it was? And that's going to come back around to that restoration, that plant restoration after the fact. Uh, but it will also give you a pretty good idea when you're doing your splicing and reconnecting of whether or not you're bringing it back up to a workable standard. Uh, conversion factors could include uh, maybe you're working in uh, all of your maps are in feet and your fibers in meters or vice versa. I tend to work pretty exclusively in kilometers these days. Uh, I do a lot of overseas work, so I've just gotten where I think in kilometers uh, because that is pretty much the standard. And that is moving more and more into a U.S. standard as well. Uh, so conversion factors could be any of those uh, various conversions from metric to English. Uh, newtons to foot pounds, feet to meters, uh, you get the general idea. You want to have that documented somewhere to make it easier for the uh, people that don't carry all those conversions in their head. Bill of materials. This is going to go back to the uh, emergency restoration kit that we're going to build uh, in our later conversation. And it's going to go to exactly the consumables that you use, exactly the materials that you need for your plant, for your fiber, for your splicing machines, for your system. Uh, we're going to talk about building an emergency restoration kit just for you. And 
this bill of materials will help us to track it so that we know if we need something else added to it later. Uh, if we need more of something, we'll know what it is that we're working with at the time. Now the last item on here could in some ways be considered the most important. We live in a day and age where there are service level agreements with uh, businesses that are, uh, what's a good word, punitive. Punitive is a good word. They're painful. I've seen quarter and even half a million dollar SLAs. If my plant isn't back on within four hours of an outage, you're going to give me a quarter of a million dollar credit. Ouch. Okay, that's, that's, you know, free cable forever, free service forever, or some of them actually require that a payment be made because of their lost business, because the fiber link was down, their service was out. They lost all of this business. Uh, in the islands down in Barbados, we had three call centers, and two of them had these kind of service level agreements. And then most of the banks were on the network down there, and they had some pretty ugly ones as well. Uh, so in the middle of the night, the fiber goes down, uh, call centers working, international call centers or uh, banking, any kind of large data transfers tend to happen in the middle of the night. If those can't happen, people are losing money. So we've got to be concerned with who is the most important customer on that link, on that fiber. Say we got a 72 count, a number I pulled out of my head. And we realize that this guy with the quarter million dollar service level agreement is on fiber, I don't know, 63. In the middle of that buffer tube, an absolute pain to get to to start with. You know what? We're going to plug him in first anyway. And the prioritized circuits will give us a cut order. And anybody that goes out on the restoration will have this cut order of who are we turning on first and in what order. There might even be dark fibers on that span that we don't even need to worry about. Uh, some places I've worked have their dark fiber on the bottom and they work from the outside in. Uh, sometimes they'll have their uh, dark fiber on the outside and they work from the uh, fiber one moving upward. However it's done in your plant, you need to have that listed on your priority circuits and your cut order for the restoration. Because I promise you, you go out and save the boss a quarter of a million dollars because you plugged in the correct fibers on the very beginning of this process, you're probably going to get remembered at Christmas time. On the other hand, you go out there and start splicing a bunch of dark fiber because you're not paying attention to the cut order. You've now, plugged, you've now turned down no customers and you miss that service level agreement and cost the boss a quarter of a million, <laughs> he's probably going to remember that too. So, like I said, of, um, next to the as-built records and route plans, uh, these prioritized circuits and knowing who your customers are on every span is probably your next most important piece of information to have during an hour. All right, story time. This is where we're going to just talk about the process. Now, this isn't bulleted. This is just going to be a conversation. I want you to picture with me, it's a Friday night, because it's always a Friday night. You never get an outage on Monday morning during work hours. Come on, that would be too easy. So it's Friday night. You've had a nice evening with your significant other, and it's just about time to settle in for the evening. You're getting comfortable, and the phone rings. You pick it up, and a voice explodes from the receiver. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Now you hang up the phone. You go to the head end. You start shooting. 
You know, by the time you get there and start your troubleshooting, the phone's already ringing with someone asking you, when's it going to be back on? You're tired. You're grumpy. You're frankly just in a really crappy mood. You're now being harassed, and the pressure is on. The world has ended, the sky is falling, and you're the one that everybody's looking at. All right, so you identify where the problem is. You even know where on the ground it is, because you've got good documentation. You go to the, to the warehouse, and you start grabbing material. All right, well, I know this is a 72-count fiber, and I've got to get this can, and I'm going to need slice leaves, I'm going to need, the, I'm going to need, I'm going to need. Somewhere in there you decide you're going to call for help and they show up at the warehouse and everybody's getting their stuff together, you're finding all of your equipment, you're getting all of your supplies and right now while all of this is happening the clock is ticking and the phone is ringing. Tensions getting higher and higher and higher, you're rushing now you get everybody out into the field, you get ready to start working on the problem, and you forgot. Oh, I need this enclosure instead of this enclosure. I wasn't the man, I was so upset, I'm, I'm frustrated, I didn't even think about getting splice leaves, or whatever it is. But something's going to get left behind. It always does. When you're trying to think under that kind of pressure, Something's going to get missed. And the clock is ticking. Now, let's pause there. Stop the tape. We're going to rewind a little ways. We're going to rewind back to you know, a week or two or a month or however long before the phone rings. And we're going to picture a Friday afternoon. The work is done. Everybody's kind of sitting around in the yard. A couple of new guys on the crew. Hey, new guy, come here. I want you to go over and get our largest count of fiber, whatever number that is. That would be up to each system. Go get me 500 feet of the largest fiber count we use, and drag it over here. And you guy number two, go in the warehouse and get two enclosures, all the stuff you're going to need to prep this cable. And you set them to prepping the cable into the enclosure. Wrap up your slack, put away everything, transport tubes, get it loaded into the trays, have the buffer tube stripped back, bare fiber laying in the trays ready to splice. And it's a little training exercise for the new guy. And they get a little experience prepping some cable. They get a little training. You can do some uh, feedback on, on the preparation technique, see how they do. But at the same time, you now have a 500-foot band-aid of the largest cable count you might have prepped on both ends with everything in place in an enclosure ready to be rolled out into the field. Now you roll that all up. Now you sit down with the, with the, the experience guys. All right, now if we were going to splice this, uh, we'll just pull a number 72 again. All right, I'm going to need uh, 144 splice sleeves. You know, let's probably go ahead and throw a couple of hundred splice sleeves in the box. Uh, we're going to want some alcohol, some chem wipes. Uh, we're going to need uh, straps to strap this back up in the air. We're going to need, we're going to need, throw all of this in the box. And you're doing this while you've got people brainstorming no stress. It's a Friday afternoon, man. We're just sitting around. Hey, well, what if we had to? And everybody's throwing ideas out there. You build this kit based on your needs, 
your equipment, your plant, and all of your consumables go into this box. Any specialty tools that you would only use in this environment, and you maybe got an extra one of these tools, throw in the box because, hell, you get out there in the field, you want to make sure you got it. Seal the box up. Put a big sticker on it and says, under pain of death, do not open emergency restoration kit. You put that in the middle of the coil of your 500-foot Band-Aid. Wrap it all up, label it again on the outside of the wrapper, and make sure that no one ever touches this until when it is needed. And I promise you it's not if. If you're in this webinar, you probably know it's not if also. It's when. So now we uh, roll back forward, and the phone is ringing, and the sky is falling, the sky is falling. All right, here's the alternative ending to this story. Hang up, pick up the phone, call your new guy. Hey, go get the emergency restoration kit, load it on the truck, get ready, uh, stand by for my call. Hang up, you call your uh, backup person. Hey, go meet the new guy, help him get the restoration kit on the truck. Uh, I'll call you guys to the location as soon as I get to the head end and troubleshoot. Boom. You go to the head end. You identify the location of your problem. You call back over to your buddy and say, okay, meet me at XYZ location. You get out to the field. You start unpacking the kit. You find out where your ends are. You unroll, and half of your work is already done. You've already got half of your prep work complete and loaded in the enclosure. You have enclosures. You have cable. Okay, so we prepped a 72. You may get out there and find out it's only a 48. So? So I don't have to splice everything. <laughs> Works for me. It's way better than prepping a 48 and getting out there and finding a 72 in the field. So you're ready for anything. You've got your prioritized list. You know who you're going to turn on first. You get out there, unroll it, and go to work. You've got all your consumables. Everything is together and ready to go. All right, end of story time. I hope that that second scenario sounds a whole lot better than the first. Because I've been in both situations. And from my experience, that second, that alternative ending, way better than the first one. And remember, it's going to happen on a Friday night. Every outage we had in three years I was in Barbados happened on a Friday night. People are in a hurry. People are tired. They're trying to rush to get their job done, and they're going to do something stupid on Friday afternoon. And I'm going to pay for it on Friday night. Only once did we have a Monday morning daytime hours break in three years. So just you got to plan for it. you got to prepare for it. The more we think about it before it happens, the better our reactions are going to be when it happens. It's just like the military. They don't practice because it's fun. They practice because when it's needed, the thought process is removed. We don't have to think. We react. We respond, we get the job done. That's what proper planning and proper preparation is going to do when the outage occurs. So a uh, little review. The emergency restoration kit should be designed based on your requirements, the products you're using, and the techniques you use in your plan all of that gets used to create your emergency restoration kit. And when I'm talking about the emergency restoration kit, I'm obviously talking mostly about consumables. Uh, having your tools available, uh, you probably got a couple of splicing trucks. Uh, your people that you have on call to respond probably have your splicing tools, your OTDRs, your power meters, light sources, all of that stuff. 
in case you're you're working with a small plant, a small system. Maybe you don't have all this stuff on hand all the time. You don't carry it around. You don't splice every day. Uh, there are some companies out there that do sell basically tools kits uh, with splicers, OTDRs, power meter light source, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a couple of those available out in the world uh, that would give you all of those tools. Uh, one of them's even got it all in a backpack. I mean, I have to admit, it's pretty stylish even. Um, it, it's a pretty good plan to have all of that that can go in the same area with the consumables so everything's grabbed at once. Uh, so those are just some of the ideas that uh, I've picked up over the years that I've been doing this. I hope that I have uh, addressed your questions and concerns. At this point, I'm going to look in the chat room and see where my mouse is. Trying to find out where, there is my pointer. All right. All right, so a couple of questions. Uh, let's see. Now, I do have uh, one question keeps coming up, and they're, they're asking about the kit. And that kit that was mentioned, um, I'm not one that usually talks about product specifically by um, uh, by manufacturer or anything like that, but I will tell you that I think precision rated optics actually has that kit that I was talking about in the backpack. It's pretty cool. It's got a splicer, an OTDR. Actually, I think this one's just got a brake locator, which is a simplified version of an OTDR. It uh, just gives you uh, more like an old copper TDR that we used on coax. It just shows me uh, where my end fault is. Uh, video inspection probe, uh, power meter, light source, uh, fiber identifier, uh, bolt locator, and a launch box. And then the consumables part and some cleaning supplies are in there also. And then the uh, uh, your consumables is still based on your particular need. All right, so that answered that question. And somebody was collecting questions for me, so if you hear papers rattling, they were printing them out and bringing them to me because me trying to read an itty bitty screen with my 50 year old eyes is getting more challenging. Let's see. Uh, now, someone asking about priority order. I, I did cover that. Um, you know, you want to know who is your uh, highest priority customer. It could be a big service level agreement. It could be 911 circuits. It could be government. It could be whatever. Someone in management is going to have to decide the order in which they want these customers turned back, uh, turned back on. And you want to make sure that that is reviewed regularly. As you add customers, you may change the priority of a particular circuit. So that's um, that's one of the problems that you might uh, run into is having an out-of-date uh, cut order. Another question here, and this is a good one, and I will admit that I didn't address this very well in the in the presentation. Um, what is the difference between aerial and underground applications of that emergency restoration kit. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm busted. Uh, the kit that I'm described works very well for aerial plants. If you've got to pull this into an underground uh, area, if you're able to pull back into the conduit, of course you're going to have to cut one of the connect one of the enclosures off and you're still going to have to prep uh, two cables on the other end, or on one end. But remember, with an emergency restoration, we're not always worried about whether it gets back underground right now. We're worried about turning the customers back on. So if you can still keep that, uh, that Band-Aid, that 500-foot Band-Aid on top of the ground, and you can just unroll it and start working, 
then you're still better off getting the plant back on if you can do it where the uh, cable can be put somewhere safely for a few days while you debrief, figure out what went wrong, how to prevent it, what do we need to do to bring it back up to spec, schedule your scheduled uh, maintenance window. All of those things can take place after the fact, after everybody's rested and had a chance to step back and breathe. Um, that's when you start doing that uh, plant restoration planning process. Hopefully you can leave your stuff above ground, the Band-Aid above ground. If not, you will just simply have to cut it off, cut off one, one enclosure, uh, pull it through your duct, and then you're going to still have to prep both, uh, both cables on that end. But still, you got a lot of your work done. You still have all your consumables in the field that you're going to need. Now, uh, let's see. In the event of the system going down, what is the approximate time frame uh, for getting the system back up to a temporary fix? That's actually a good question, and that's something that you need to consider in your restoration plan, which was the very top of our uh, documentation. That restoration plan is going to be based on your service level agreement. What is it that you told your customers? Uh, how was the system sold to these customers? What promises were made? Uh, so all of that is going to go into the planning uh, for your restoration plan and building your uh, time frames and deadlines and who gets woke up when. And I've got time for one more question here. And let's see, when a temporary fix has been implemented, how long should it be before the permanent fix is applied? And I guess we're referring to the uh, plant restoration after the emergency restoration. And again, time frames are going to be very uh, specific to uh, your individual needs, your individual goals. It's also going to be dependent upon how, how bad is it. I mean, if you just got some stuff strapped up across, a, you know, across some driveways uh, and it needs to be reburied, well, you've got the problem of it's, it's you know, potentially exposed, but then you've also got the how long is it going to take to get construction in there to, to do what's necessary to get it back in the ground. Uh, do I need to hang new strands? Uh, am I going to have to do this? Am I going to have to do that? All of those questions get answered in that debrief and planning session. Now, there's no hard, fast rules on, on most of this. A common sense, however uncommon that is in this day and age, uh, should be uh, the, the means by which you decide what to do next. And if we take the time on the front end to plan and consider, then when the problem arises, we are best prepared. The rest will kind of take care of itself after that. As long as we, you know, get our hands out from in front of our faces and think down the road and think past the ends of our noses, uh, all of these situations will go much better and much smoother in the field. I want to thank everybody for attending today. Uh, I've had a great time talking with you guys, and I look forward to our next webinar. Uh, the topic will be announced uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but stay tuned. We will be doing these as close to monthly as is uh, humanly possible. Again, thanks to everyone. And if you've got questions that did not get addressed, uh, you can send them to sales at fiberoptic.com and put in the subject line webinar question. And those will get directed to me, and I'll try to answer any additional questions that didn't, that, uh, didn't get answered uh, in the time frame we had available. So again, thanks to everybody, and we look forward to uh, seeing you in the next webinar.